All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to the uh, 2022 Educational Recognition Awards and the last lecture. It's uh, wonderful to join all of you for this annual tradition, one that recognizes, celebrates, and salutes the heartbeat of our academic institution, our coterie of education and teachers who give meaning, substance, and uh, substance and sustenance to our academic mission and educational community. Uh, the faculty of our three graduate schools are exceptional stewards of our students' education and those colleagues receiving awards this afternoon are the standard bearers of excellence who exemplify the roles of teacher and mentor. To our awardees, congratulations on your well-deserved recognition and thank you for contributing so much to our learning environment. In the second half of today's program, we'll have the opportunity to learn from one of the best and uh, most beloved educators here at UMass, Dr. P.Y. Fan, when he delivers uh, this year's last lecture entitled, You'll Always Have a Job. So it's worth waiting to hear it so that you'll know what he actually means. And I look forward to returning just before that to announce the recipient of the 2022 Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Mentoring. Now, it's a pleasure to begin the program this afternoon as Dean Joan Fatello of the Tan Chan Fing Graduate School of Nursing kicks off the Educational Recognition Awards, Dean Fatello. Well, good afternoon. It is so good to be here in person. Um, so I'm going to give the first award is the Dean's Award, and I have the honor of selecting this individual. The other awards are selected by our learners. And so to be honest, I, I will reflect their comments for the faculty that get that award. But I want to ask Dr. Susan Sullivan Bollier to come up because she is the recipient of this year's Dean's Award. <laughs> so let me share some brief remarks about this extraordinary scholar, researcher, and educator. For decades, Dr. Susan Sullivan Bollier has worked clinically with children who have special health care needs and their families on a day-to-day -day management and continuity of care. She received her DNSC and completed a three-year postdoc fellowship at Yale University School of Nursing. Her main areas of expertise are family-focused interventions that address parent and child social support and education for type 1 diabetes day-to-day -day management, including the innovation of using a child-size human patient simulator for parent and children and child education. She also uses qualitative descriptions to inform her in interventions. Dr. Sullivan Bollier returned to UMass three years ago. She had been with us for 11 years, then took a little hiatus to New York University as director of their PhD program, but came back to us three years ago as the associate dean uh, for research and innovation. And she's worked tirelessly with her inter and intra professional colleagues and PhD students towards improving the day-to-day -day management of families with children. Dr. Bollier is well known for extraordinary mentoring. She provides to both faculty, students, and staff from all three schools. She is a true scholar, one of only two faculty in the GSN who has received an R01 funding with a plethora of publications and presentations in her field of nursing research. As I've witnessed Dr. Bollier's leadership style, she is definitely what I would call an authentic, caring, and collaborative leader. And Susan has also decided to retire this September, so this is my last chance to bestow this meaningful recognition on her. I could go on and on, but let me to conclude with announcing that Dr. Susan Sullivan Bollier is this year's 2022 Dean's Award in another unprecedented year, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so the other three um, folks that we will be presenting awards to have been selected by students. And the first one was nominated um, is our GEP faculty, Dr. Beth Keating. Beth, are you here? Yes, she is. Great, come on up. Congratulations. So this is what her learners have said about Beth. Professor Keating teaches for many of the GEP courses. Throughout all of her courses, she has consistently shown how much she cares about the, both the well-being and success of her students. She facilitates rich discussion during class, which is difficult to do over Zoom, as many of us know and fosters a sense of community. She provides thorough feedback and commentary on all of our assignments. She listens empathetically to her students and always prioritizes discussion. Now the learner said she is always available to students. She has been a great professor, is very responsive with emails, and exhibits leadership and dedication. A third student said, I am nominating Professor Keaton because I believe she exemplifies everything a nurse should be. She is always there to help her students and shows true caring for us. She keeps our interests in mind and sends us in the direction of our interests. I would like to congratulate Beth Keating on being the Graduate Entry Pathway Faculty Award for Outstanding Excellence. Congratulations. So the next faculty award is with the DNP, and Alex Minot, I know you're right here. Come on up, Alex. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Alex. In my six years, I have never seen one faculty member receive all of the accolades that he has received this year. He is the coordinator of the Acute and Critical Care um, DNP tracked for the GSN, and I think it just is a reflection of what's been going on with the pandemic that Alex received incredible, incredible accolades from his learners. So, Alex, here goes. Dr. Alex Minard has um, received the most nominations in the Doctoral of Nursing practice, and it, be, it is shared by one, uh, many students. So when I share all of the accolades, you're gonna understand why. First student said, Alex is a very knowledgeable faculty member who always has great clinical references. Although I could continue talking about how great a mentor Alex is, he is an even better person. Alex always ensures all of his students are doing well outside of school to ensure they are able to bring their best into the classroom. I highly recommend Alex for this award. Another student said, Alex has been an incredible mentor and instructor for those on the acute care, critical care DNP class. This year has been so challenging for all students. Our class has been working in the acute setting as nurses while juggling the school workload and ever evolving clinical situation. Alex has given us his all his unwavering support. He always makes himself available to aid us in our healthcare journey, delivering a quality content in class, and giving career advice, and being a voice of reason for us all. No matter how busy he is as he works in the ICU, he always makes time to meet with each of us to ensure our success and encourage us to follow our passions. Another student said, Alex is a phenomenal professor and has broken down the material we have learned this year, making it easier to understand and learn. He has gone above and beyond in helping coordinate our clinical experiences and is always available to answer any questions that we have. Alex is open-minded and always willing to listen to suggestions on how we can improve this course for both our class and the future. 
Another student said, he is very organized, thoughtful, personable. He seems to genuinely care about each of our well-being. He is very intelligent and a captivating lecturer. He really knows his stuff and explains things in a way that is accessible. He puts an extra effort to help us get in touch with the people that will help us achieve our educational goals. He challenges us to a high level of academic excellence through rigorous testing. He listens to us and is responsive to our needs. He is absolutely perfect as our program director, and I am grateful to have benefited from his teaching and organizational leadership. The law student said, Alex has helped not only myself, but my entire class by being a fantastic support system. When I had been going through a rutch patch at my clinical site, he took me as his own preceptee for as long as I needed. He makes us feel appreciated and has empathy as he went through this program himself. Many of the students say he has made their, pro their experience better. He is truly an asset to the school and to the ACNP DNP program. And UMass is truly blessed to have him as a faculty member. Congratulations, Alex. All right, the next faculty award is for excellence in the PhD program. And this has been another person. By the way, Alex received this same award in 2020, but we um, were on, on Zoom, and so I couldn't do it in person. So I got to do it two years later. So congratulations, Alex. And Nancy, the same thing. Nancy was nominated several years ago, and I get to do this in person. So come on up, Nancy. So this is what her learners had to say about Nancy, uh, Dr. Morris. Dr. Morris is highly student-focused. She continuously keeps students apprised of ongoing scholarship, additional education, and extracurricular seminars or group discussion opportunities. Her classes are always well-prepared and informative. And perhaps most importantly, she seeks student input, not in an intimidating or putting one on the spot way, but in a fun and interactive way, methods, in my opinion, most conducive to learning and retention. Another student said, Dr. Morris is always available for questions, whether by phone, Zoom, or email, and is always prompt and supportive. Dr. Morris generally wants her students to learn and graduate. As just one of many, many examples through the three and a half years I have been a GSN student, she is conducting a voluntary comps overview and Q&A session in early April for those taking the August comps. Her entire student approach is, in my opinion, this. If the student is doing the work and genuinely trying, Dr. Morris will go above and beyond to do her utmost to continuously encourage and support the students towards completion. The last student said, lastly, the pandemic has been difficult in many respects for so many people. Needless to say, indeed, for many people, it has been tragic. But for those of us for whom it has only been disruptive, too many long-standing routines and thankfully not tragic. Has presented new challenges, Dr. Morris has been among the most supportive, understanding, and encouraging professors I have ever had. Congratulations, Dr. Nancy Morris. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. David Weaver, who will give the GSBS Awards. Thank you, and thank you for accepting me standing in today. Um, the first award is the Ec Educational Award, is the Dean's Award for Outstanding Contributions to Graduate Education. This will go to Dr. Daryl Bosco, who is unfortunately not able to be here. Dr. Daryl Bosco is a professor in the Department of Neurology. This award is bestowed on a faculty member who has made important contributions to the GSBS through mentoring, teaching, training, and in leadership. Several talented students have flourished and developed into excellent scientists because of Daryl's thoughtful and committed mentorship. 
As a course director, she has created a very highly valued positive learning environment. And she is serving as a general examiner. She has served as a first year advisor. She currently leads the academic standards committee toward increased access, rigor, clarity, and fairness. Her service as faculty advisor to the graduate school graduate student body committee has contributed to the impact and professional development of our student leaders. Daryl's leadership of DRIVE is raising awareness of the importance of creating inclusive environments in our classrooms and our research groups. Dean Lane and we all appreciate the time that Daryl makes available to students while wearing the many hats she wears. Thank you, Daryl. The Faculty Award for Outstanding Contributions to Curricular Development goes to Dr. T Anthony Imbolzano, who is also not able to be here. Um, Tony is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biotechnology, and he's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Office of Postdoctoral Scholars within the GSBS. Tony has contributed significantly to the Professionalism and Research Conduct Required Course, or PARC. The PARC course helps to center our students in areas that are foundational to success in research, such as responsible data management, recognizing and revolving conflicts of interest, professionalism and peer review and publishing, and similar areas. Tony goes the extra mile to make sure that students are participating in class. PARC's subject matter does not typically excite students, um, and it makes it harder, and a, it's a barrier to teaching this subject. It's that much, that much more difficult. So Tony clearly invests himself entirely into teaching this subject, and it makes a big difference in impacting our students' learning. Thank you, Dr. Tony Imbolzano. The Faculty Award for Outstanding Research Mentoring and Commitment to Student Professional Development is being shared by Drs. Vanny Busey and Philip Tai. Would you please come forward? Are you? Vanny will show. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've not met either of you before. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Dr. Vanny Busi is an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Physiological Systems. Vanny's nominators describe him as a respectful and supportive mentor with an unwavering commitment to our students' development. His enthusiasm, positive outlook, and love of science encourages his students to pursue excellence. He fosters a rewarding learning environment in his research group where success of his students is prioritized. Dr. Philip Tai is an assistant professor in the same department, the Department of Microbiology and Physiological Systems, who seem to have stuffed the ballot box this year, uh, with very deserving candidates. Phil joined UMass Chan in 2019, as has quickly become recognized as an incredibly supportive and trusted mentor. He is very hands-on in his training, but also encourages independence in project development and experimental approaches. Discussions with Phil always motivate and reignite passion for research. He's generally invested in the success of all who work in his lab. Would Dr. Lisa Lojek Please come forward. This is the faculty award for outstanding contributions to training, mentoring, and or professional advancement by a postdoctoral associate. So Dr. Lisa Lojek is a postdoctoral associate in the laboratory of Christopher Sassetti in the Department of Microbiology and Physiological Systems. Um, I'd like to preface this award that this is a reminder this postdocs are not obligated to teach or to mentor. And with this award, we recognize not only effectiveness, but also a personal commitment that many of our UMass Chan postdocs bring to the GSBS learning environment. Lisa has demonstrated a genuine talent and enthusiasm for training graduate students. Dr. Sassetti and his trainees have highlighted how she brought her bacteriology-focused expertise not only to his research group, but also to the department. Lisa's specific expertise in bacteriology, bacteriology is unique, and this has made her the go-to expert on the floor. Instead of simply answering her questions, colleagues, as they arose, she took the initiative to organize and teach a 10-session 10 10 session 
bacteriology course for more than a dozen GSBS students and postdocs in the department, both those specifically interested in bacterial pathogenesis as well as immunologists that study bacterial infections. Lisa's generosity with her time and talents is demonstrated not only through the helpful guidance with, exceptional, with experimental design that she has provided for many students, but also in her science concern, in sincere, excuse me, also in her sincere concern for their well-being and development as scientists. Next is the Faculty Award for Outstanding Contributions in the Lecture and Classroom Settings. Would Dr. Jerome Allison please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Jerome Allison is the Chair and Professor of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences. Jerome brings passion and enthusiasm for the subject to his students. His knowledge and his empathy for the students shine through and is especially helpful to those who are new to the subject. His talent for teaching are on full display in, this outsta in his, his outstanding communication skills, his ability to listen, and his high responsiveness to his students. Jerome's dedication to learners extends far beyond the classroom. He is an effective mentor and a tireless advocate for students in the research environment and more broadly across the institution. And finally, the Educational Service Award. Would Dr. Brian Lewis please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Brian Lewis is a professor in the Department of Molecular Cell and Cancer Biology and is the George F. Booth Chair in the Basic Sciences. Now this is the first year that this award has been given. It is for faculty whose committed service has positively impacted the GSBS learning environment. Brian has been committed to inclusion and diversity and has positively impacted the GSBS learning environment with his supportive guidance to students. Brian has been a co-leader on several success, on two successful training grants that have not only helped bring more diversity to the Morningside Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, but also have created opportunities for all of us to learn how to foster and be more inclusive in our environment. And with that, I will conclude the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences portion of this and bring up Dr. Ann Larkin to introduce the awards for the T.H. Chan School of Medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Weaver, and I always get excited at this time of year. Um, I'm sorry that uh, more of us couldn't be here in person, but for all of the students that are streaming uh, this live, I, I so appreciate you being here with us this evening. So it is my honor and privilege to provide the introduction for our presenters for the T.H. Chan School of Medicine Educational Awards. But before I do that, I, I just want to just recognize that this gives us an opportunity to reflect on where we've come from, but also where we want to go, sort of setting the course, charting our course, so to speak. And as I was considering all of this, I thought about a couple of highlights that really epitomize our institution. One is our faculty and students' investment in education. The creation of VISTA, our new curriculum, which we'll be rolling out in August, service on curriculum committees, peer mentoring, and the ongoing work on all aspects of our accreditation, really all aspects of everything that we do every day. But also the unique relationship between our students and the faculty. It is an immensely valuable relationship through their learning communities, through their courses, through their clerkships, through, again, the curriculum committees. And all of this combined makes for a very exciting time for us and difficulty in recognizing all that our faculty and students do uh, for each other within the School of Medicine. So with that, I don't, I, 
I don't believe that Aaron and Trish really need any introduction to all of you. We all know them as incredibly talented co-chairs of our Educational Policy Committee. But I just want to acknowledge a couple of things about them that um, neither of them are satisfied with the status quo. As leaders, both of them actively pursue best practice. They advocate tirelessly for our educational mission at the T.H. Chan School of Medicine. And for me personally, they've served as immense resources and support. And for that, I thank both of you really from the bottom of my heart. So with that, welcome to the podium, Drs. McMaster and Seymour. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Larkin, for such a nice introduction. Um, so the first award that I will present today is for our Educational Achievement Star Award. And the Star Award is given in recognition of excellence for outstanding individual or team achievements in undergraduate medical education, typically for a specific curricular enhancement or innovation. So the first recipients of the Star Award are, is actually a very important team, the iCells team. And I'd like to ask two representatives from that team, Sylvia Stanhope and Jorge Yarzebski, please to come forward. The ISIL staff, which includes managers, educational specialists, educators, sim techs, and standardized patients, are being recognized for their outstanding transition to virtual learning and teaching throughout the course of the COVID pandemic. This team has responded to and anticipated change such that student learning and assessment continued without significant disruption, despite campus and clinical site closures and restrictions. The team has pivoted rapidly multiple times to ensure the support of critical existing programs like the Doctoring and Clinical Skills course, and at the same time built new models such as BLS training for incoming students and remote simulation participation for students in the transition courses. They retrained SPs for virtual and hybrid teaching and assessment and supported both clerkship OSCEs and our core clinical assessment. They worked on site and evenings willingly even when most were home and have adapted to continuous change and growth as true educators. Thank you all. Our second recipient of the Star Award is Dr. Lisa Hall. Can you come forward, please? <laughs> Dr. Hall is the course co-director for the Principles of Human Genetics course, and she is creating exceptional learning materials that enable students with diverse academic experiences and approaches to understand genetics-related content. The independent learning modules, or ILMs, that she has developed and continues to develop reflect both her deep content knowledge and an equally deep understanding of ways to present and explain content that address a variety of learning approaches and needs. These new ILMs employ technology in creative and often unique ways and are a showcase of approaches that engage students and promote learning. The ILMs have been highly rated by students and subsequent exam performance demonstrates that they are highly effective in enhanced student learning. Dr. Hall has also inspired others to consider similar approaches to support diverse ways of learning. She is truly a star in her ability to create an inclusive learning environment that promotes student success and embraces drive principles. Congratulations. The final recipient of one of our STAR Awards is the anatomy team, and I'd like to ask Dr. Yasmin Carter, Dr. Chris Ornelia, Amanda Collins, and Dr. Leila Gianaris to come forward, please. This STAR Award recognized the new, very successful integration of the Epic Electronic Healthcare Record classroom, or EHRC, into the anatomy lab donor experience. Each anatomical donor is a patient in the EHRC, and learners use the EHRC to practice documentation and communication skills by adding a donor's past medical and social history, 
documenting pathologies and anatomic variations, and communicating information to their team about each dissection lab as encounter notes. The faculty team conceptualized and implemented the project, preparing an instructional manual, compiling donor medical and social histories, assigning donors an anonymized names, underscoring diversity, and adding complementary content to the development structure and function course. This included two new simulation sessions in which learners examine CT scans of their donors using a clinical viewer and document their observations in the EHRC. These novel uses of the EHRC integrate anatomy, imaging, and multiple areas of health system science, emphasizing diversity. Congratulations to you all. The next awards to present are for our resident fellow award for excellence in medical student education. And this award recognizes a resident or fellow who's especially motivated and inspired to teach students, serves as a mentor and a powerful role model for students, or improves the educational content of student rotations or clerkships. And the first recipient is from the university campus, Dr. Gianna Wilkie, please come forward. Dr. Wilkie is a Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellow in the Department of OBGYN, who is being recognized for her contributions to the OBGYN clerkship. Gianna has been integral to the clerkship with her clinical teaching, directing a new simulation case for students each block, and volunteering as a student oral examiner. She has an abundance of enthusiasm and positive energy towards teaching. This is noted by all that work with her from faculty to residents and to students. This simulation is a particularly large time commitment extending into the late evening and it is not something expected of a fellow. In the clinical setting, she takes students under her wing, always looking for teaching opportunities and makes sure they feel welcome and included on the team. She also provides oral exams, which is an important component to the final student evaluation, taking on more exams than most faculty. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Wilkie. And our second recipient is from our Bay State campus. Dr. Neil DeVoe, please come forward. <laughs> Dr. DeVoe is an internal medicine chief resident and is an outstanding advocate for our Perch medical students. He has volunteered his time to facilitate simulation sessions to teach students lumbar puncture skills and is currently collaborating to develop an ICU simulation experience for the PERCH MS4 students as part of their transition to advanced studies at Bay State. Dr. DeVoe went above and beyond for the MS3 students to solicit a group of student volunteers to collaborate with him to participate in a clinical reasoning medicine grand rounds, which was well received by the Department of Medicine faculty and an amazing opportunity for the third year students. Congratulations, Dr. DeVoe. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure next to present the Patient as Teacher Award. And I'd like to call Sterling and Jessica Cross to the front, please. Welcome. So this award's given to a patient or patient's family who's had a significantly positive impact on our learners. And Sterling and Jessica were nominated by Tim Gibson, one of our pediatric hospitalists. And I'm going to read to you from that nomination. It's an honor for me to nominate Sterling Cross and his mother Jessica for this year's Patient Teacher Award through the EPC. Sterling was known prenatally to have trisomy 18, a serious genetic disorder, where average life expectancy is approximately two weeks. 
Sterling survived and was discharged home from the NICU, but after development of a severe respiratory infection, was readmitted to the pediatric ICU. He made a gradual recovery, albeit with many bumps in the road. He's now 10 months old. Throughout his entire life, his mother Jessica has been his strongest advocate, but also the best parent teacher we've known on the inpatient pediatric unit. She's taught countless students so much more than the science of trisomy 18. She's taught our learners how patients and families want to be talked to, how they want to be cared for, and the power of unwavering optimism. Even in a setting of significant setbacks, Jessica has always embraced her role as the teacher of future caregivers and has furthered our understanding of communication and compassion in the doctor-patient relationship. We give our unending gratitude for her efforts. Thank you, Jessica and Sterling. We'll move on now to the Student Star Awards. These are given to students for an educational innovation or curricular development effort. And I'd like to call Lindsay Walsh to the front. I'm not sure she's here, though. OK, I'm going to tell you about Lindsay anyway, because she's amazing. So Lindsay was nominated by the Emergency Medicine faculty. They describe her as an outstanding candidate for this award. And I quote, in the clinical setting, she's bright, thoughtful, and pro a proactive learner who's hardworking, independent, and adapts to various clinical scenarios. She's excelled in the area of research as well. She identified what she felt was a gap in the curriculum around opioid overdose recognition and naloxone administration and designed a study to evaluate this for her capstone project. She enrolled over 100 participants and is currently preparing this for publication. Lindsay plans to use the results to propose incorporation of naloxone training into the MS1 curriculum here. Additionally, Lindsay recently represented UMass at the National Emergency Medicine Conference to present a case and won Best Visual Presentation for her case on a post-COVID massive PE. Congratulations to Lindsay. And our second recipient for the Student Star Award is Jillian Belgrad. Please come to the front. Jillian was nominated by the VISTA Curriculum Leadership Team for her contributions to this massive curriculum renovation project. Her enthusiasm for the curriculum redesign and channeling the student voice has not wavered in the last two years. She attends dozens of meetings weekly and is not afraid to express um, student feedback to a group of seasoned faculty, but always does this in a very professional manner. Jillian has been a champion of engaged learning, not just calling for it, but also willing to build it. She's juggled all of her student right, responsibilities right along with her volunteer student rep role and has stepped into some intimidating places like town halls, departmental grand rounds, advisory committee meetings to present on this new curriculum and has actively recruited and managed other student volunteers for this big project. We are so impressed by her and can't wait to see where she goes in her multifaceted career path. Congratulations, Jillian. Finally, I'd like to uh, award the Administrative Staff Award. Can I call Vicki Cohen to the front, please? <laughs> Vicki's been a dynamo since she stepped into her OUME work last year. We're nominating her in particular for her EPC support, though this is only one small piece of her educational role in OUME. Very shortly after joining the EPC team, she became an important and contributing member to our leadership group with practical and tech-savvy suggestions around management and improved support for this team. She's diligent, organized, extremely professional in all her interactions with the EPC and our members. Most importantly, she's open to tests of change and doesn't get too entrenched in processes. She often provides ideas for improved efficiency and enhanced effectiveness. The functionality of the Education Policy Committee has grown markedly since her onboarding, and we are so grateful that she works with us. Thank you. 
And with that, I would like to call Dean Flott to the lectern to present the Lamar Souter Awards. It's my honor to present the Lamar Souter Award. Uh, may I ask to doc Dr. Howard Sachs to please come forward and be recognized. Named for our founding dean, the Lamar Souter Award for Excellence in Medical Student Education recognizes a faculty member who has made an indelible imprint on UMass Chan and American medical education. Dr. Sachs has done that for the last 30 years. As a superb teacher, he's recently been recognized with three Outstanding Medical Educator Awards and two Specialty Advisor of the Year Awards for our medical students. He's also a true innovator in medical education. He developed and single-handedly presents the highly rated patients course that is the culmination of the second year of medical school. Dubbed the 12 days in March, the patients course provides intense, carefully curated reviews of pulmonary, cardiovascular, renal, endocrine, rheumatologic, GI, hepatology, and hematology. Dr. Sachs's Dr. Satz teaches students to approach clinical problems as he and other expert diagnosticians do, focusing heavily on a broad-based interpretation of a patient's symptoms rather than on diseases. His extremely popular and engaging presentations have interactive question-based formats, sometimes with novel embedded micro-lectures. Dr. Sachs's educational approaches are also available to students here and around the country through on, an online resource that he has developed featuring a playlist of more than 150 videos. Congratulations, Howard. It's now my pleasure to uh, welcome Chancellor Michael Collins to the podium. Well, my own name, let me add congratulations to all of this afternoon's recipients. It's uh, really wonderful to see the, the commitment to teaching and, and the true joy that those who have the opportunity to present these awards have in recognizing your many contributions to our learners, so congratulations uh, to all of you. Uh, to conclude the awards portion of today's celebration, I have the wonderful pleasure to announce the recipient of the 2022 Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Mentoring. This award, which we initiated in 2016, celebrates mentoring as a foundational element of our academic community and the broader science, nursing, and medical professions. To be considered for this ward, a faculty member must have been part of our community for at least three years, hold the rank of associate or full professor, and through their daily work, exemplify the role of and demonstrate the qualities associated with an outstanding mentor. Here at UMass Chan, we benefit from an extraordinarily committed faculty rich with scholars who believe in the principle of lifelong learning and who actively engage in developing and enriching the knowledge and talents of others so that those following in their footsteps will find fulfillment in their careers and make an impact in their professions. If mentoring is one of those rarest of gifts, one that is given both given, that one that is both given and received, then this year's awardee has had a most gifted career. With this as introduction, it's my distinct privilege to present the 2022 Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Mentoring to Dr. Vivian Budnick. Dr. Budnick, would you come forward? Dr. Budnick, 
Your nomination garnered an inspiring number of support letters from faculty at all stages of their careers. In reviewing these testimonials, it was clearly evident that you are universally held in the highest esteem by your colleagues and collaborators and are recognized as, and I quote, a quintessential mentor. Supporting and guiding others, they say, is at the core of your leadership style and success. After being awarded tenure at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, you joined our medical school community in 2003 and immediately made an impact by making novel discoveries related to the development of the nervous system and synaptic plasticity while at the same time revealing and elevating the strengths of those around you. Colleague after colleague after colleague made special mention of your insightful advice that helped them to learn how to run their lab, push scientific boundaries, and write their first NIH grants, which as many of you know is an anxiety provoking, tension filled, and laborious process, as well as an immensely important career milestone. By serving as a sounding board and providing critical feedback, often in the middle of the night, Junior faculty in your Department of Neurobiology credit, credit you with helping nearly all of them receive R01 funding on their first submission. For this, your grateful colleagues have dubbed you the Great Whisperer <laughs> and say, Vivian provides the magic sauce. Over the decades of your career, the beneficiaries of your SAGE Council include many who are now among our most esteemed and most successful research colleagues, not only here at UMass Chan, but indeed around the globe. As chair of the Department of Neurobiology for the last eight years, you have nurtured new areas of investigation in developmental neurobiology, aging, memory, sleep, patterned behavior, and neurodegeneration while establishing multidisciplinary research programs as exemplified by your collaborative leadership of the NeuroNexus Institute, and by overseeing the integration of the Brudnick Neuropsychiatry Research Institute in the, into the Department of Neurobiology. Those who have observed your mentoring of dozens of students and postdocs say that, and I quote, she asks a lot, but the results are impressive. Through countless hours, thoughtful critiques and caring conversations, Dr. Budnick, you have been one of the most visible and effective campus leaders in empowering women and underrepresented minorities in the basic sciences. As one of your colleagues wrote, many different types of investments can be made by leaders, but none is more valuable as the time, attention, and expertise that scientific mentoring represents. Vivian, you are a wonderful exemplar of how such an approach can lead to great success, not only for yourself, but for the scores of your mentees. It is with deep appreciation for the enduring return on your tireless investment as a mentor. It is a privilege, therefore, to recognize you as the 2022 recipient of the Chancellor's Award for, the, for Excellence in Mentoring. Congratulations. These aren't free, you know. Come on. <laughs> I'm pleased now to transition to this year's last lecture, a celebration recognizing the art of teaching and those within our faculty ranks who have distinguished themselves as master teachers and esteemed educators. The 2022 last lecture will be presented by P.Y. Fan, Professor of Medicine, who is the recipient of the 2021 Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching and the 2022 Manning Prize for Excellence in Teaching. By way of introducing Dr. Fan, I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to the screen for a short video.
an educator who has intelligence, credibility, dependability, humility, wisdom, dedication, eloquence, and who is passionate across the continuum of learners, stands tall amongst peers, stands committed to mentees, and stands stolidly for excellence. After tireless years as an educator, this year's Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching shall now rest upon the shoulders of Peng Yen Fitz. Congratulations, Dr. For nearly 20 years, you have played integral roles in the education of our learners. Medical students, residents, and fellows have all benefited from your intellect and commitment to their education. It's a privilege to present you with this year's Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching. Congratulations. Dr. Fan is joined today by his wife, Dr. Elise Pune, a fellow physician and rheumatologist. Dr. Fan, we're now ready to become your students. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction, Chancellor Collins. I not really often heard myself described as standing tall, but uh, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> it's a first time for everything. Uh, well, Chancellor Collins, Provost Flott, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to be speaking here today, especially knowing that in the audience, there's so many outstanding educators from whom I've learned so much over the years. However, I have to admit, and I am quite surprised, and not just because I've been described as tall. I never really thought I'd be a teacher, not, not, certainly not expecting to be called a master educator. When I was a kid, I loved watching Jacques Cousteau documentaries. And I always thought I was going to end up as an oceanographer. Unfortunately, that dream was torpedoed early on by a very harsh reality. I get seasick incredibly easily. In fact, it's so bad that my propensity for motion sickness is the stuff of legend in my family. This left me without a clear plan for my future, but my father had other ideas. For some reason, he decided that all of his children should become physicians. Now I have no idea where this came from because my, my dad's a chemical engineer and none of our family or our uh, family friends are doctors. Nevertheless, he was very certain that this was the right path. You'll get to be a scientist, and you'll get to heal people at the same time, he'd say. Everyone will respect you, he'd say. And as the kicker, you'll always have a job. <laughs> now, I was a bit of a goofy kid, so maybe that last part was really less a selling point and more a reflection of his own misgivings about my ability to maintain gainful employment. <laughs> Be that as it may, that point did stick in my head. My dad's a very persuasive person, and sure enough, I did go to medical school, as did all my siblings. Now, the studies were difficult enough much, of course, just challenging to go to medical school. But the part that I found most hard was actually when I began to see patients. You see, I was really very shy. In fact, frankly, I was probably very awkward. It was extremely hard for me to go to talk to strangers, let alone ask them a lot of questions, many of which were intensely personal. However, I soon found that for some reason, I was actually fairly comfortable when I was the one answering the questions, the one explaining things. I really enjoyed the process of figuring out the best way to help people understand their conditions, the tests we were doing, uh, and the treatments that we were planning. It was incredibly rewarding to me to somehow find the right words and the relevant analogies to help people understand what was going on. 
The confidence that I gained from teaching while providing care was absolutely critical to my growth from being a student into a physician. And that experience has helped me in innumerable ways. For example, while I'm never gonna be a social butterfly, I've come to enjoy meeting people and I can even hold my own in making small talk. To build a connection with the patient, it helps to know their upbringing. It helps to know where they're from, what kind of work they do, and so on. The process of understanding someone's background and social context is really very similar to doing a needs assessment of a learner. So it was a natural transition for me to extend my teaching from patients to others. By the time I became a junior attending at Duke University, education was already a big part of my day-to-day -day work. So much so that one of my mentors, who is an outstanding teacher in his own right, decided to take me aside. He actually wanted to warn me that teaching was not only very high, it was not highly valued or rewarded at Duke. He wasn't really trying to dissuade me from spending time with students and house staff, but he did want me to understand the full implications of my career choices. Flash forward one year, and I had the opportunity to return to New England to take a position at UMass. From the start, I was incredibly lucky to have great role models and mentors within my own division. In addition, I've gained invaluable guidance and inspiration from being surrounded by so many talented and innovative teachers. Many of you are coming from diverse disciplines and you make up this rich and vibrant school community. I'd like to take a moment now just to name some of the people who have had an especially great impact on me. And I really apologize as there's simply too many of you to, for me to acknowledge all, uh, everyone who's helped me. I did want to say some special words uh, to Jeff Stoff and thank him for recruiting me here, as well as providing me mentorship, especially during my early years. I owe David Clive a deep debt of gratitude for being the ultimate role model of a clinician educator slash comedian. <laughs> I'd like to thank Rick Forster for being someone with sage advice whenever I've needed it and who's been able to support me through some very difficult times. And I'd like to thank David Hatem and Mike Ennis as they've taken me in and guided me uh, into the learning community as a mentor the most satisfying role that I've had in medical education. Honestly, the teaching side of my work has been so fulfilling that it's kept me fresh and engaged, more than making up for the aggravations and the frustrations that you sometimes get with clinical practice. Lastly, I'd really like to acknowledge the medical school for providing such terrific infrastructure and allocating such great financial commitment and giving me these fantastic opportunities to develop my skills in different facets of teaching and mentorship. I've had the privilege of working with learners at many levels of training and in a variety of roles. With such a range of experiences, I found that I have certain areas that I favor. I particularly enjoy the cyclical rhythm of the academic year in the same way that I like having four seasons uh, uh, during the year as well. The annual influx of new learners, whether students, interns, or fellows, brings such energy and a sense of renewal. It's an old cliche, you don't wanna be in the hospital in July. While that's true if you're a patient, it's actually a great time to be on call. You just can't help but be invigorated by the enthusiasm and the excitement of new interns, even if you have to spend some time giving them directions or showing them where all the bathrooms are. I particularly like teaching procedures and seeing the thrill that the learners get from them. There's really something special about performing a physical action as well as gaining knowledge about a test or a treatment. I have to say that I have learned the hard way though you sometimes have to tell the learner to curb their enthusiasm. This came after I had a patient almost faint when a fellow blurted out, that was my first biopsy. 
just after completing the procedure. I really enjoy the challenge of finding the right language or the appropriate examples to effectively convey information. Whether a patient or a learner is having difficulty, it's very gratifying to find other ways to explain concepts successfully. During my residency and fellowship training in North Carolina, where NASCAR is king, I had to learn about car engines because I found that patients could readily relate to medical issues framed in automotive terms. I guess it's true. Chronic kidney disease really is like a failing exhaust system. <laughs> I also enjoy the way that students challenge my understanding of concepts that I have long taken for granted. They approach topics with an open mind and their original thinking and unusual questions force me to reconsider my preconceptions. In this way, I often gain a rekindled interest and deeper understanding of the subject. While it's a lot of fun, I have to admit that sometimes I just can't understand where the questions come from. One year, two students quietly hung back as the rest of their classmates asked their questions and left after I'd finished a talk on acute kidney injury. I was expecting a question about the molecular basis of cell damage, but that's not what they wanted to know. They sort of came forward and sheepishly asked two things. The first, why is it bad to drink seawater? As I pondered that one, they followed it up with the second question, why is it bad to drink urine? Believe it or not, I actually answered those questions. <laughs> but I did feel compelled to tell them that I did not think the material was going to be on the boards. <laughs> to me, the best part of medical education is mentoring. As with patients, it's just so fulfilling to build a good relationship with a mentee. With a strong understanding of their unique talents, interests, and achievements, you can truly tailor your advising to best help them realize their goals and their potential. In my current role as Vice Chair for Education for the Department of Medicine, I get to write a letter of support for every student applying for internal medicine training. I really love the process of meeting with the students, going over their CVs, helping them with their personal statements, all the while trying to find that special angle that we can highlight to help them stand out as they apply for residency. I think my favorite achievement as a medical educator is, ironically, to have helped train a cardiologist. During my tenure as a nephrology fellowship director, one of our fellows was everything you could possibly ask for in a learner. She was intelligent, well-read, extraordinarily dedicated to her patients. She had a great work ethic and spent long hours in the hospital. Thankfully, this was before the work hour guidelines came into, into play. At her mid-year review, I really couldn't think of anything to tell her. I could think of nothing to advise her on except for one thing. I told her that I hoped that I would see her have more enjoyment for her work because she was always so serious. She didn't say anything and left until the next day when she came back to tell me that the reason that she wasn't enjoying her fellowship was that she really wanted to be a cardiologist. Unfortunately, she'd apparently feared that cardiology was going to take too much of her time and that she was afraid that it would eliminate her work-life balance. Unfortunately, she had discovered that nephrology was pretty much the same amount of work and now she was truly regretting her decision. Now, unfortunately, my first thought was, why did I open my big mouth? <laughs> because now, of course, I'm going to lose my best fellow and I'm going to have to figure out how to Find somebody else. Thankfully, that only lasted a few seconds. And then I kind of swallowed hard and said, OK, let's try to get you into cardiology. Luck was with us that year, as there was actually an open position in the cardiology fellowship. And uh, this woman was able to transfer at the end of the year. And true to her personality, she gave us the same high quality effort 
through the rest of the year, even knowing that she would be leaving the field. While I did not end up training a colleague, I'm still very proud that I helped this wonderful doctor find the career that she wanted. Sometimes, the most important thing is to realize that you're just not the right teacher. I wish it was all about success, but of course, sometimes things don't go the way that you'd like. And as a result, I'm still continuously learning as an educator. My most humbling experience came 13, after 13 years as a fellowship director, when I felt I had pretty much seen it all. That year, one of our fellows was quite strong clinically, uh, and he was always cheerful, upbeat, and even jocular with faculty, staff, and his peers. However, this person would never answer emails, repeatedly missed deadlines, and sometimes wouldn't show up for meetings. The unprofessional conduct gradually included taking unauthorized time off, always with some type of excuse. Oh, I had a relative visiting. I had some car trouble. I had a terrible cold. I tried several approaches to try to figure out what was wrong, including numerous one-on-one -on -one meetings and enlisting the help of faculty who were close to the fellow. Whenever I asked whether there were any personal issues, including any type of substance dependence, I got repeated denials. Finally, near the end of the academic year, I was required to report the unprofessional conduct on a credentialing form that I had to send to the fellow's new hospital. It was only then that the fellow became completely distraught and explained that they were truly severely depressed. Since this information came at the very end of fellowship, we only had time to arrange a single appointment with our counseling service. Then we had time only to alert her, their new employer about this issue and hope for the best. I will always be disappointed that I did not find a, uh, did not find a way to recognize this problem and help the learner more quickly. It must have been a terrible couple of years, and I feel so badly that I did not manage to intervene earlier. I don't want it to be too much of a downer, so I have to tell you there's a happy epilogue to this. Several months later, I got a call from a psychiatrist who obviously couldn't share any details for patient confidentiality reasons, but wanted me to know that the fellow had actually followed up and was actually doing very well. Furthermore, some of our staff have remained Facebook friends with our former fellow. And even taking into account the rose-colored view that you get through social media, our graduate seems to be living a life that we'd all envy. Of course, no talk now could be complete without some discussion of the COVID pandemic. From an educational viewpoint, COVID-19 has isolated learners it's taken away the in-person interactions between teachers and students for the better part of two years. However, the pandemic has also swept in many positive changes as well. While the trends towards remote learning were already uh, well established, COVID has tremendously accelerated development of virtual teaching techniques. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, remote educational platforms have enabled us to reach many more learners, both, um, uh, both asynchronously and in real time. Zoom and other platforms have given us so much more flexibility in recruiting outstanding educators whose availability would otherwise be very limited if their physical presence was required. As teachers, we've really adapted to all these new methods. We've learned to multitask with chat functions and breakout rooms. We've tinkered with amusing backgrounds. And inevitably, we've struggled with muting and unmuting. The, the biggest adjustment that I've made is to speak more slowly and in a deeper voice. Why? It's so I don't sound ridiculously squeaky when the students watch me on video at three times normal speed.
COVID-19 has also dramatically altered the educational aspect of patient care. During the pandemic, attitudes towards physicians, scientists, and educators have shifted drastically. Some patients no longer trust us. Instead, they may think we are sheeple, blindly accepting fake information. They may actually consider us as sellouts, our actions and advice influenced by greed or politics. The, the entire scientific system of investigation and peer review has been undermined. People will now debate us after having, and here's that dreaded phrase, done their own research, citing data of very questionable validity. It really hurts to be called an agent of big pharma or to be derided as an unwitting pawn of some nefarious conspiracy. We're all struggling to find the words to connect with people who view us with suspicion or worse. Yet, despite the physical, mental, and emotional toll, we must keep trying, though it seems a near impossible task at times. I've actually fallen back on my experience with challenging learners in these situations. You persevere, you keep lines of communication open, you keep trying different approaches, different ways of talking about the same topic, and then maybe, just maybe, things will click. Of course, COVID is not the only factor drastically altering the healthcare landscape. As big business, we are all vulnerable to the same market forces that are currently wreaking havoc on the world economy. We're seeing downsizing of services, such as happening with the pediatric program at Tufts. Here at home in central Massachusetts, we face the threat of increased competition with the recent efforts of Mass General Brigham to establish clinics in our re region. Not to introduce a when the robots come for our jobs vibe, but you, can't, you have to acknowledge that telehealth has actually uh, reduced the need for some types of on-site providers, particularly in specialties like radiology. These changes affect our learners as they're trying to make important career decisions. They also affect us as we wonder about the viability of our own jobs. I won't pretend uh, that I can foretell how this, um, how this is uh, all gonna play out, but I am confident that as educators, uh, we will um, adapt and find better ways of teaching. As I come to a close, I wish to express my gratitude to my family who have kept me grounded and sane. To my sons, Andrew and Grant, I'm proud of you, and I appreciate your unwavering support, even when I was coaching you in soccer. <laughs> it's safe to say that I was the antithesis of Bill Belichick in my methods, my style, and sadly, my one loss record. <laughs> to my wife, Elise, thank you very much for always being there. I know I can count on your sage counsel and that you'll always support me and balance me and you're always watching out for me, even when I forget to do it. Reflecting on my time at UMass, I can't help but note that I've actually followed in my father's footsteps. Although he's a chemical engineer, he was a professor at the University of New Hampshire for 46 years, serving as chair of the department for over three decades. While he never really talked much about his teaching, I'm sure he must have connected with his students very well. How do I know? Well, he's been retired for 15 years. And just a few weeks ago, several of his former students reached out to him through Zoom to pay their respects and reminisce. I can only hope that I've had that type of impact on some of the learners that I've worked with. Looking back, my dad didn't get everything right. He may not have been on target about always being respected. He, was not, he may not even be right about always having a job, but he certainly guided me into a career that I love, and for that, I'll always be grateful. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, uh, P.Y. That was really uh, terrific and uh, I'm sure has brought a lot of thoughts to all of our minds who see teaching as so important. Congratulations and thank you once again. That concludes our ceremony this afternoon and thank all of you very much for joining us and I wish you all a good day. Thank you.